this is one of their mobile kitchens and they actually is that even some uh, what I call habitual beautiful stop and shop in the Wilton penalty but it was actually a tax and that it Good evening and welcome once again to the Marty Heiser Show. You know, on this show many times I will go on a rant about political issues at hand. Yet with the quality of guests that I have on this program tonight, I'm going to tone it back. I'm going to filter myself. I'm not going to go off about the politics of the day. I'm not going to mention Mitt Romney or that crazy real estate developer or what's going on. I'm going to be peaceful. And, and, and earlier, you know, you saw the therapy dog. The therapy dog is in the studio. And, you know, even without the dog right here on my lap, I feel as if it's calmed my heart down. Really, look, my hands aren't shaking. My heart rate, it may be the yoga instructor from last week, Deanne Mincer, in her great book, 52 Days. I'm, I'm really reevaluating things. I, I don't need to be upset. The fact that the Republican establishment is quashing the will of the people, openly expressed by their votes, this isn't upsetting me. I'm just being calm. The fact that the Democratic leader, Hillary Clinton, has now had a witness that has immunity and is about to turn state's evidence about her having an email, I'm not going to get into that. I'm just going to focus on my guests because we have some incredibly profound guests this evening, and I'm going to look to them to allow me to not go on a rant. So that's something I just came to tonight, and I'm delighted to have Emanuela Palmares here. Yeah. Dan Berry's own. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming in. I appreciate it. And you are running for the 110th district here as a state rep. Now, this is a, this is a position in Hartford that's been held by uh, Bob Godfrey for quite some time. And you're trying to unseat an incumbent. Never an easy thing to do. Why do you think that the voters from this region are going to come to your side in this? Because the time has come. The time has come for a presentation that actually reflects the makeup of the 110th district. And I think that's the important thing that I can represent in this race. And, and it's been interesting to see the reaction of the people. They're really excited. Yeah, now we're going, you mentioned before, it's 40% uh, Latino in the district? Yes. 40, 60? Yes, it's 40% Latino in the district. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Godfrey has been in there for 24 years. Um, and we have been outreaching already to different communities who have really never had a relationship with him. Hmm. Yeah, you know, it's interesting right now in Connecticut, we are one of three states that is actually losing population. We had the most recent, uh, you know, bout of tax increases and General Electric came to the governor and said, look, it's getting too expensive to have our headquarters here. Don't raise taxes again. And I heard from so many of my liberal Democratic friends that they're just bluffing. It's a big corporation. They got tons of money. And your guy, Bob, uh, Bob Godfrey, actually called GE the skunk at the picnic. The skunk at the picnic, oh see, I need the therapy dog. Where, Where's okay. the therapy the, god, the, Marty? <laughs> the skunk at the picnic is the one that provides jobs, high paying jobs, it creates uh, an ability to buy real estate, to keep the real estate values, that fund our schools, let alone uh, uh, um, all the philanthropic enterprises that Absolutely. having GE here. There's a, there's a wonderful family in, in uh, Ridgefield, the Bornsteins, that I think he was a, a chief financial officer or something, houses on the market, they're gone, they're moving. And it's all because of what's going on at Hartford. How are you gonna address that? There's a big disconnect in the conversations we're having right now um, mm -hmm. all across our community as far as looking at um, companies like GE and them being portrayed that he, this is a 
jet setting, CEO, leaving the community, no one's losing jobs. Um, when you're looking at the makeup of the one tenth, the people of the one tenth know that that's not the case. They know that that CEO needs a landscaper, a babysitter, um, a housekeeper. A house painter. Exactly. This is clearly, I have a painting business. You know, yeah, they, let's make that plug, right? Yeah, a house yeah. painter. Yes, yes. Um, so yeah. they know that that doesn't fly that they're feeling in their pockets right now that there's something going on with the state that's just wrong. And the direction that it's going, it's not benefiting them. Yeah, and, and, and there's this kind of, I don't know, well, it's just the 1% and, and uh, you know, we don't have to, we don't have to do that. Um, periodically we get people to call in. By the way, the number here is 438-2003. If you'd like to talk with Emanuela Palmeras, who's running for the 110th district, please uh, uh, phone in. As you go out there, I know you've been to uh, a number of the Portuguese churches. You were a member of the Latin and Puerto Rican Affairs Commission in Hartford. What is the reaction you're getting from the people that you speak to? They're excited that someone is outreaching to them to talk about government, to talk mm -hmm. about the issues that are, um, you know, really at, at this time hurting the state of Connecticut. We have mm -hmm. a lot of things um, that we need to be discussing right now and really reevaluating the direction the state has gone. And people are excited to be able to have those talks because they really haven't had the opportunity to have a seat at the table. You know, when we uh, think about the state of Connecticut, are you ready for the bad news from a Republican point of view? Sure. Every single congressional district has a Democrat representing us the governor, the lieutenant governor, the state senate, the state uh, representatives, all dominated by Democrats, the two senators, Democrats. I mean, this is Democrat from coast to coast here. And, and the Republican Party, it seems, is somewhat anemic to have any effect whatsoever. Um, how are you going to crack that? What, I mean, you huddle with Mark Bowden. This is a little island of fiscally conservative, you know, dynamic, uh, Republicanism here in Danbury, how is that going to be transferred up to Hartford when you have an incumbent that's been there for a long time? Well, number one, we know that Danbury has been working, you know, um, yeah. because Mark has been very successful. Mayor Bowden has been very successful. I was lucky enough to have him. We were talking about before as big my, endorsement. My, yeah, he was my U.S. civics teacher, oh, yeah, so yeah, yeah, you yeah, know yeah. that that he, he he should endorse me. He has to. <laughs> yeah. I'm a product of of that as well, and a pro product of Danbury Public Schools. Just but, out of curiosity, how was Mayor Bowden as a teacher? What was his approach? Was he a hard grader? Lots of homework? What was his? Approach? I do have to say, it was around his first term as a state rep. Oh, okay, okay. So, you know, he, he was very passionate about politics, and mm -hmm. um, we all caught on to it, you know, and, what, and what, here we are. what grade was this? Was high school? Was yeah, it? high school, high, high school. school. Yeah, Danbury High School. High school. Danbury High School. Go Headers, yeah, Danbury okay. High School. Uh -huh. um, I'm actually going, going to have my 15-year reunion this year, so I'm really excited about that. But um, <laughs> the problem really is that we're a couple of seats away from yeah. having control of the house. And that's really what we have to look at. Okay. We, every race, every state race is going to be very important this year mm -hmm. because what you describe is exactly one of the issues that we have in the state of Connecticut right now. The balance of power is gone. We, yeah. There's no checks and balances. You know, we have That's not had party rule. Exactly. Yeah. We have not had a seat at the table. Every time we have offered up our opinion and our suggestions, for instance, to the budget process, and we have not been taken into consideration. We are yeah. not heard. And we represent the other percentage of the people who elected Republican representatives. Yeah. And those voices are not being heard. They're not in the room. So if we win seats, that means we're going to have control of the house, and that's the first step to restoring the balance. Yeah, we, uh, when I, w I was reading in the paper after GE left, mm -hmm. it was like the week after, and Governor Malloy comes out and says, now is not the time for finger pointing. We have to put our heads together and work together and see how we can, uh, we can get this economy back on track. Meanwhile, I know John Fry. I know Dan Carter. They've been on the show a number of times. Um, uh, 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 Senator McLaughlin, Tony Boucher. All of them are pulling their hair out because they've offered budgets. No tax increases. Able to retire some of this debt. They don't even get a hearing. There's no vote. There's no anything. But then the sky falls. GE pulls out. And Malloy's like, oh, look, now's not the time to point fingers. Well, the heck it isn't. It's, if there's... It's very much the time to point fingers. Uh, caller, do you have a question for candidate Emanuela Palmeras, who's running for the 110th district here in Danbury? Do you have a question? Yes, the first 
for the for myself who doesn't know what the 110th is, what what is the district that it represents? That's a good question. It is a great and then question. I have another question. Sure. Uh, what's your name? Pardon me. Your name? Dorothy. Dorothy, the 110th, it's one of the few districts that only encapsulates Danbury. And actually, it, if you look at Main Street Danbury and downtown Danbury, right. it's pretty much the core of the city and a couple of its surrounding um, neighborhoods. Wonderful. I wish I was there to vote, but I'll just, I have a comment now or a question for you. Sure. The rumblings in Hartford, because they need money or the Dems need money, that lets you know what side I'm on. <laughs> They're going to try and get taxes, tax the elderly, those of us that have put money away for long-term care. Any long-term care, what they would like to be able to do, and are trying to now do it behind closed doors, tax that as income. Any long-term care payments. And they would like to be able to put it back one to two years and get this through. Would love your comments and what would you do if you find out? I mean, the, the verifications are uh, hard to get because they don't want to admit this is what they're doing. Num number one, Dorothy. Great question. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's a great question. We have to focus on how do we keep people in the state. Mm -hmm. And these are, it's one of those policies that actually inspire people to leave Connecticut. And we have to stop bleeding people out. Mm -hmm. And in the case of people like Dorothy, who worked their whole lives, who've been a resident of the state, it's really sad that at this point of their lives, they have to choose to not be in Connecticut. Yeah. I, I, sit, I sit on the Aging in Place Council here in Danbury for the past um, you know, year or so. So it's Aging, aging in, place in Place Council. Yes, and okay. this is a community council that comes together to to study how can we um, make sure that seniors in our area are going to be able to be in their homes in the future mm -hmm. or choose to age the way that they choose to. Um, so we, it's something that it's dear to my heart. Um, you know, my parents, I think about them and I think about my future also in the state. But culturally, you know, I was born in Brazil. I was fortunate enough to become a naturalized citizen here in this country. But we are told in my culture that I have to take care of my parents, that my uh -huh. parents have to live with me once they get older. Uh -huh. um, and dad's here in the studio. I'm just going to do a shout out. Love you, dad. Thanks for being here always. <laughs> it's a good um, system, right, dad? They got to yeah. look after you. I like that. Because yeah. they've looked after me. Yeah. And, but the way that we have things set up in Connecticut right now, it would be very very difficult for me to be able to be my parents um, caretaker mm -hmm. so these are things that I'm really concerned about and I think that we should really focus in keeping people in Connecticut especially those that gave all their life to the state yeah and they say I mean it uh, and these lists of states business friendly state we're at the bottom of the list We've been dead the last. Uh, states to retire in we're at the bottom of the right. list um, uh, the state freedom day that's when the day that you can stop working for the government, paying all state, federal, and local taxes. I think our state uh, freedom day, or tax freedom day was May 7th, and now it's May 9th or May 10th. It's one of the worst in the country. Um, I mean, people have choices. And, and the, it's such a beloved state. It's such a wonderful place to raise a family. Lovely communities, good schools, good higher education. Uh, the cultural advantages are just incredible. But I think we're, we're choking the goose that's laid the golden egg by running businesses out of here, running retired people out of here, taxing them to death. I mean, I just don't understand why people, clear thinking, good-natured good people on the other side of the political spectrum, and I'm at, I'm at the point where I'm like, pleading because you guys got all the cards you're running this state could you take a could you take a chill pill on raising the taxes on everyone you're killing us and it's very frustrating marty for our um republican delegation because yeah. they have the ideas they want to have a seat at the table but right now because of the balance of power they don't even get to really put forth these ideas in a sense of bringing back common sense. And this is why every race is going to be so important this year. Mm -hmm. The state seats are really going to be the pathway for us to restoring the state. Well, okay, you talked a little bit about educational cost sharing, yes. the formula. Yes. And this affects Danbury quite profoundly. How, how much of the, do you know, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but the Board of Ed budget for the town or city of Danbury, what percentage of that comes directly from the state? Do you, ha do you know? 
So right now, if you're a Danbury taxpayer, yeah. um, 70 cents of every dollar you pay goes uh -huh. to um, funding education. Right. A big reason is because of the lack of reimbursement that we get from the state of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. um, a quick comparison, you know, um, Danbury gets back around $3,700 per student per year from the state of Connecticut uh -huh. because of this education cost sharing formula, while a town like Waterbury gets over 8,000. So, and Bridgeport, forget about it, it's huge. So the problem yeah. is, you know, we had a shift in our community um, in the past few years. Um, the population of children who have applied for free reduced lunch has nearly doubled mm -hmm. since they froze this education cost sharing formula back in 2003. Okay, wait, so, so the number of students applying for free school lunch mm -hmm. has doubled. Yeah. So there's need in the community. There's need in the community. Okay. And supposedly the, the cost sharing formula is supposed to adjust accordingly and mm -hmm. provide the reimbursement back to that municipality to cover some of those costs. Mm -hmm. While they froze the formula in 2013, where that was not the case, where we didn't have, you know, um, this this high, this spike in the in the population. So just back of the envelope, mm -hmm. you say about thirty seven hundred dollars of a average school uh, or a student. Every student. That's so every student is what about twelve grand, thirteen grand. The cost is about twelve thousand dollars. Okay, so if I'm student. saying uh, approximately thirty percent of the board of ed funding comes from the state. Yes. Uh, approximately. I'm yes. just putting it. So if they jiggle that number and don't give, it, it really puts the squeeze on the school system. It, it does. Yeah. There, when when I ran for Board of Ed um, in the last municipal cycle. Um, I heard you got more votes than uh, people on the other side, but because of minority representation, you were the last one out on the musical chairs. Is right. that about it? Yeah. Okay. But, you know, in our case, it's bittersweet because that means that we have a good, strong Republican leadership going here <laughs> okay, in the city well, of Danbury. Um, but it also gave me the opportunity to understand that what I wanted to do in a Board of Ed mm -hmm. would not have been possible because the Danbury Board of Ed is really suffering from $30 million in underfunding by the state of Connecticut. Mm. So any measure, anything that we would have want to do to change the course of the education system in Connecticut would have been impossible. Mm. The problem really was in Hartford. And when we look at that chain of command again, like you said in the beginning, we have a Democratic governor, we have a Democratic majority, yeah. and in the 110th, we have a Democratic representative, uh -huh. and he's been unable to restore that funding to Danbury. Why not? I thought it would be like the old boy network, like, hey, he's on the team, you know, he should be able to. And that's stuff. really what made me pause and think that it's time for a change, because yeah. you would think that that would make it easier mm -hmm. for people to, you know, make sure that Danbury got its fair share. Um, we know that the ECS um, formula, the education cost sharing formula, it's 11 formulas rolled into one. And in, in, in really because every time someone sits at the head of the committee that decides education funding, they tweak the formula a little bit that ends up benefiting their district a little bit more. Yeah. So we have not been able to make sure that Danbury gets its fair share when it comes to education. And that is something that affects everyone. Yeah. It's not just people that have children in the school system. Your property values go down, and Danbury right now is going on a very positive trend in the sense that we don't have, you know, a high crime rate. Um, you know, we have a low unemployment rate. We have, I um, mean, you know, a fairly vibrant economy. Exactly. I mean, Mayor Bowden has been able to attract businesses, and he's been smart because I think he got that one big business from uh, Italy. Yes. Uh, up by Bowring and Engelheim. Yes. Speaking of Bowring and Engelheim, another great. Please corporate stay. neighbor, please Don't go stay. anywhere. Yeah, from, from Danbury and from Ridgefield, we love you. We leave in the Boehringer Engelheim, little German. <laughs> nice. Uh, uh, we, we love you, please stay. Uh, I mean, just a profound, it's a pharmaceutical company and they're working on drugs that uh, that alleviate um, uh, and allow people to live with HIV and AIDS and are, are working towards a cure. I mean, unbelievable facilities up there. They had these, I happen to know a little bit because painting wise, but they had these clean rooms where they do research research and everything, it's... I know a number uh, of people in the community that work um, for a Beringer and, and, you know, people from the Portuguese community, yeah. my dad's friends. I have a couple of friends that graduated high school with me that now work there. Um, it, it's that connection again, Marty. Yeah, and see, this the, is our livelihood. Th these are our families. They're going to lose their means. And we have to stop talking about this in the sense of pitching the big guy versus yeah. the little guy. This is a community. Yeah. And I am not going to let people to 
um, erode that fabric. Yeah. The embryo works because we watch out for each other. Yeah, and, then, and, and we so don't look at who's making what. We know that everyone needs to be sitting at the table and working together. You know, I feel for um, organizations like the United Way. Mm -hmm. You know, if you yeah. look at the United Way of Western Connecticut, their headquarters in the heart of Danbury, how many dollars and donations have they lost? Yeah. And, and what will they lose if Beringer decides to yeah. leave? No, you no, I, absolutely. We, got, we saw the same thing in, I'm from Ridgefield. Same thing with the loss of some of these GE executives. I mean, these are pillars of the community. Uh, they you know, really are. Youth sports. Uh, the the uh, the library. Uh, we have this wonderful movie theater that's run by uh, folks with special needs. The entire you give them vocational mm -hmm. training. The prospector, all heavily supported by some of these corporate partners and and some of their executives. And to lose them or badmouth them or call them the skunk at the picnic is just absolutely shooting ourselves in the foot. For for what I don't I don't get it. I just you know this is kind of like. I don't know, like class envy sort of thing. It, it, it's really wearing a little thin, and it's kind of wrecking it for everyone. Caller, do you have a question for Emanuela Palmares, who's running for the 110th district? Yes, I do have another question. On Tuesday night, one of the biggest discussions at the council meeting in Danbury, I watched it on the TV. Caller, you you got to you got to get out more. You know what I mean? I you, first you're watching this show and I there's know, a debate well, on okay. and there's some great NBA games. So right off you got to just question where you're going in life, you know? And I, then you're watching the council uh, at, at I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, Marty at 72 what else do you want? Okay, okay. Well, listen, um, I I appreciate the audience. It's a vast okay. audience. Uh, my, my my vast audience. Vast, vast. But here's the question. There was a great discussion on Tuesday night at the council meeting about hiring a lobbyist. And I would like to know what your guest has to think about it, because uh, if, if, it's interesting who was the, for, for it and who was against it. I just, I just love to hear her opinion. Thank Hi, you. Hiring a lobbyist for the city of Danbury to lobby Hartford and where have you. To, yes. Okay, hey. e excellent. And, and it, had a, it had a lot to do with, with this um, underfunding of our schools. Mm. My personal take on it is that the best lobbyist, specifically for this issue of education cost sharing um, formulas, is the community. Mm. We have not engaged the community on this issue. We have mm. not really taken our time to educate Danbury parents on what's going on and have them go to Hartford and tell our story. Yeah. Um, but unfortunately, the lobbying also, we have to look at it in a holistic point of view, where a lot of towns in Connecticut, they really get their share of the pie because they have three, four, five, six lobbyists mm -hmm. um, in Hartford just for the benefit of that one town. New Haven is one of them. They mm -hmm. have a gazillion lobbyists. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when it comes to this issue of education, I believe that this needs to be a grassroots movement from parents. I'm a parent myself. Mm -hmm. My son has special needs, and I see the strain. It's very difficult to get services, and it's very difficult to look out in the future mm -hmm. and see what's going to be available for him as far as quality as well, when our system is just so constrained. Okay, lightning round. Um, hospitals, similar situation. They're underfunded by $140 million, and we're talking Danbury Hospital. Again, I mean, if you just look at it economically, what an, what an economic engine that hospital is for, for this region. You know, the, the amount of salaries that come out of it, specialists, doctors, what have you, it's incredible. Um, what are we doing there? Uh, hospitals actually almost, if, if, you, if you couldn't imagine, it's actually a little bit worse than the education aspect uh -huh. of it because the hospital started, for instance, last year, they, they thought they were going to be taxed $9 million. And then a few months later, they, they see the deficit again, and then they say, oh, well, no, it's 12. Um, sorry, it's $54 million. Um, Wait, from 9 to 12 to 54? Yeah, wow. Danbury Hospital alone. Sounds like my, wife, my daughter's wedding. But anyways, <laughs> go ahead. Uh -huh. So what happens is right now we have a system that uh -huh. allows the state of Connecticut to balance its budget in the backs of hospitals. And unfortunately, that's going to end up being something that we all are going to suffer from. Today, um, Governor Malloy announced that $140 million in payments for services that the hospitals already provided to Connecticut patients mm -hmm. will not be paid. Wow. And they will have to kind of absorb that lack of payment. So It's time to clean the house. Caller, where am I wrong on my analysis of this blaming everything on liberal Democrats? Caller, are you there? 
Yeah, of course I'm here, Marty. I just want to say I'm here, Marty. Go right ahead. Uh, firstly, um, I don't remember John Fry being on your show uh, for a couple of years. He's always welcome. We love us some John Fry. Now, I would like to say, outside of myself, who has been a guest, uh, this uh, young lady um, is is very impressive. I haven't seen anybody under 50 who's, who is a, not a white male on your show in about 10 years, except for the occasional Tony Boucher uh, uh, token appearance. Um, and I know she's running as a Republican, and I, as you know, Marty, I'm a progressive Democrat, not a socialist, not a liberal, but a progressive New York City Democrat stuck in Richfield with high taxes. My question <laughs> Can't the find a good people, bagel anywhere. Let her on a knish. <laughs> However, I'm a big fan of Danbury. I spend time in Danbury. Uh, I'd like to know she's running uh, uh, for statewide office. I'd like to make a quick comment about your constant trashing of Malloy. GE didn't decide just to pick up in the last week. This has been going on for 10 years. But my question for the young lady, if she would be bold enough to actually answer this question, since Terry Boucher, Tony Boucher, and most of your guests never answer any questions. Where does she stand on the abortion issue? Is she pro-choice? No. Another question is, and uh, with the vacancy in the Supreme Court now, uh, she's a constitutionalist, so she believes that the president has a responsibility to appoint a justice during his, his uh, nine months remaining in, in office. Thank you very much, and I wish you good luck in your, in your campaign. Thank you. Good questions. Where do you stand on life and uh, the uh, Obama as far as uh, appointing or designating or what do they call it? The promoting, putting one, the oh, yes, putting the, forth the, a candidate. Yes. yes. Um, you know, first I got to ravel a little bit on the fact that I've impressed. Uh, you know, a progressive Democrat from Richfield. And I yes. think that that's that's a that I've got a good thing going here. Yes, yes. My crossover effect, and it's oh, a great thing. Yeah, no, you've left a very, <laughs> very good impression. Yeah, you know, I, I. He actually has written for the New York Times. I happen to know this guy. Seriously, true. Great, yeah, great. he's a writer. So. I, I welcome the question, and I think that you know. I have, I have different perspectives on certain issues, mm -hmm. and I think that's the beauty of the Republican Party in Connecticut right now. There's a lot of room for diversity, and not just diversity of um, ethnic background or color, but also of thought. And I think that that's the difference between the Democrats and Republicans right now. Mm -hmm. In Connecticut, I'm not gonna say unfortunately that that's a reflection of the whole party in, in the country right now, mm -hmm. because people are uncomfortable with differences of thoughts right now in our party, but I think that in Connecticut there is that. I am someone who, because of my faith, I believe in that a life is a life. You know, I have a son who has special needs, and I was asked that question when we were going through, um, you know, my pregnancy. Mm. If because of the possibility of my son um, having special needs, if I wanted to, you know, uh, make a decision on that. Mm. So. For me, it, it was a very personal, it's a very personal issue. My mm -hmm. son is the light of my world. Caillou has autism. And I was chosen to be his mother. And mm. I think God made that happen for me because I had to learn from him. Mm. And I learned from my son that I need to meet people where they are. And I need to understand where they are. Because in order for me to interact with Caillou, I have to go into his world. Mm. Um, and I think that that's what's missing in a dialogue in politics right now. Um, I, I get a lot that because I'm Republican, people may think that I am not logic and I'm not an intelligent person and mm -hmm. that I'm gonna use my faith um, as my judgment and they already dismiss my faith by thinking that because I'm an evangelical person that I don't think at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the same time, I am not going to assume that every Democrat is a liberal that wants to give everything away. We need to focus on understanding. Hmm. What about those different philosophies? Stroke a chord with that person. Um, while, how can we have a conversation to understand where we're coming from and figure out a mutual direction we want to go? Hmm. We are living in the same great country. And one thing that I have to say as my immigrant experience is that, you know, American its worst day, it's still American its best day. I agree with that. I was born in Brazil. I, my parents came to this country with nothing. 
And we were able to build our businesses. I was raised in Danbury, in downtown Danbury, with my parents working three jobs. Um, you know, we would go to school during the day. My mom would pick me up at school. I would do the last two house cleaning jobs with my mom and my sister, mm. and then we'd go, to, go home, have dinner, meet up with dad, go clean super union markets at night, mm. do a homework in a car. Wow. These are the first years of our lives here. Mm. I've been here in this country for 22 years. It hasn't been that long ago. Yeah. And this is my story. And this is also the story of so many other people that came before me. And that's the beauty of this country. So I think that there's so much that we have in common and there's so much that we love about America. And I think that right now, we're not looking for where we stand together. We're just looking at where we fall apart. Mm. And that's why there's so much animosity and no progress. Mm. Uh, nominating a Supreme Court justice. Should Obama do that? Shouldn't he? You know, when, when people, talk about the term conservative, one of the things that comes to my mind is someone who has a lot of respect for systems mm -hmm. in place and rules. And um, regardless of who is in office, um, you know, according to a constitution, he has the right to nominate, mm -hmm. you know, a, a justice. Um, I think that I look to our party to say that if right now President Obama is president, it's not a fault of President Obama. We did not do a good job in picking a candidate at that mm -hmm. election cycle to make mm -hmm. sure that this is a Republican White House. So we have to deal right now with our choices and mm -hmm. understand that the systems are in place and those are the systems. Well, thank you so much for coming in. I really appreciate thank it very much. Thank you for much. having me. I sure. hope you have me back. Absolutely. We've got, we've got uh, you know, 52 Thursdays every year. So Long I'm looking for November. content. I, I Long way to November. I need more around. help, Marty. We, we, you're always welcome. We'll have you back, and I really appreciate it. I really and appreciate it. And if people want to learn more about me, they can visit my website. It's mm -hmm. www.emanuela2016.com. That's E-M-A-N-U-E-L-A. 2016.com. It's easy. Just put Emanuela, Google it, Emanuela, Danbury, Connecticut, tons of stuff comes on. <laughs> you can go on her Facebook page. She has long talks from Abraham Lincoln. It's a wonderful page. You'll really like it. Thanks so much for coming Thank in. Thank you, Marty. And we'll definitely have, have you back. Have a great night. Okay. Now, earlier this year, I put out this video, this, uh, this TV show, and it was about a recent trip that I had to Bangladesh. And I'm telling you, this was a life-changing trip. I was joined by my next guest, Mark Munchie, and John Dissinger, who is also a pastor at Walnut Hill Community Church. And we went on this, uh, no, 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 don't come that way, come that way. <laughs> and we went on, we went on this uh, uh, just absolutely life-changing trip to the country of Bangladesh. And just to give you an idea about Bangladesh, it's 156 million people in a geographic area the size of the state of Wisconsin. So it's a very packed country. It has a very high poverty level. The uh, religious breakdown is 84% Muslim, and as you'll see from some of the pictures we're about to show you, very conservative Muslim. Many women uh, take the veil and are covered in, in uh, pretty extreme burqas. The other 14% are Hindu, and really the Christian portion of the country is something along the lines of, well, let's just say under 1%. I think it's 0.04%. Yet there's a Christian ministry that's been in Bangladesh, I believe, since 1971, when there was a, a rather large war that was fought there, called the Christian Service Society. And the Christian Service Society runs orphanages and clinics and hospitals, as well as um, uh, uh, schools. And what I also found very fascinating is there's an extensive uh, uh, prostitution uh, uh, community and, and economy that, that they have there, and they have a profound ministry to some of the sex workers there and the children of some of the sex workers, and uh, it was just an incredible trip. And joining me right now is the executive director of the Christian Service Society and a dear friend of mine, Mark Munchie, and uh, Pastor John Dissinger, who was also uh, my intrepid travel partner there. And um, it, was just, uh, it was just a great time. And I'm just so thankful that you're able to come. We're going to set this up and just go through this. But why don't you just give us an outline of the Christian Service Society, your work, and what your motivation, why, why, why you have 
committed your entire life to this. Thank you, Marty. Um, Christian Service Society, uh, CSS, um, is uh, started, as uh, you, you know, you mentioned, Marty, that uh, 1972 in Bangladesh. Um, and we are a non-profit uh, organization, it's called NGO. Um, we, you know, it's, as Mari said, it's Bangladesh is um, one of the poorest country in the world. Um, there's so much need. And um, as a Christian organization, uh, we want to, through our, uh, like in scripture say that uh, through our life, through our work, we want to show Christ's love. That's our focus to the people, those who are very, very poor. Uh, you know, street kids, uh, orphan kids, um, uh, uh, then um, the prostitute, those who are very neglected, show them the Christ love through our work, through our, uh, through our life. Uh, that's, our, that's our goal, that's our, that's our aim. Yeah, well it's really incredible because when you go, for example, the, the hospital we visited, it seemed like every single patient there was Muslim. And I, I, I make that judgment just based on their, their garb yeah. and the burqas and the, and, and the food. Right. Yeah. And um, to see a Christian, which is such a minute minority in that country, and yet they're the ones that are providing some of these desperately needed services to the rest of the community, and they're, it's well received. They're, yeah. they're respected. There isn't yeah. any of this animosity towards the Christians. No, that's very true. That's yeah. very true. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, like you said, it's a Muslim country, but uh, these people, they see that, you know, how much we care for them, you know? I mean, mm. so many times uh, these people ask me that, you know, you guys are Christian, why you're here? Why, why you're helping us? So we tell them because of, you know, Jesus, Jesus loves you, you know, Jesus loves us, and we want to show his love. And so they know we care for them, you know, we love them. And that's why you see that, you know, like you said, that most of our places service in the hospital, other places in the clinics, um, you know, all of them are Muslim, almost all of them. Yeah. But mm -hmm. uh, they're very grateful that, you know, we are able to help them. Yeah. Now, you're uh, the pastor of care and outreach. What's your, what is your title yeah, at Walnut Hill? That's my title, yep. And I, am, I do have the opportunity and the privilege to um, oversee our ministries at Walnut Hill um, many churches call it missions. At Walnut Hill, we call it church in action. We're called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Um, not only here in Danbury, but partnering with the church around the world to do the same. So, um, yeah, we have the opportunity at Walnut Hill to come alongside of over 29 different ministries around the world. Um, one of which is is with uh, with Mark and and the work that. Uh, uh, his team is doing uh, in Bangladesh. Um, so yeah, it's a great, it's a now, great opportunity. Now you were, you had, you had a job, you worked yeah. with IBM, yeah, I was, uh, you had a long career there. I was there. loving the earlier discussion with Emmanuel about you know the decision with GE, for example, because yeah. I was sitting and listening to all of that wearing my old corporate hat, yeah. um, former IBMer. I was with IBM for uh, over 13 and a half years and prior to that, worked in uh, up in Boston with a number of corporations up there. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so this is, I mean, I mean, you you weren't uh, a man of the cloth, a pastor your entire life. This is kind of your uh, uh, golden years uh, involved in the, in this type of yeah, ministry. Yeah, it it's, something it's that an you... interesting story. I don't I don't think we have all night to to share it. But, uh -huh. um, basically, the uh, the opportunity um, to begin to think about doing something different and what God was calling uh, my wife and I, you know, out of, uh, out of the corporate world and, uh, and really what, what all of that experience and time that he gave me uh, in terms of the skills that I had the opportunity to develop in corporate America um, uh, combined with my faith and, um, you know, my love for Jesus uh, really paved the, the, the way for an opportunity that came up to um, actually be the care pastor at Walnut Hill. That was where uh -huh. I started. Mm -hmm. And I still have a passion for that. I, do, I still uh, uh, have the opportunity to oversee our care ministry there as well. Mm -hmm. um, so with that corporate kind of background and, and uh, working in that space, uh, now bringing some of that skill and knowledge to um, you know, the pastor 
role is, is pretty exciting. I mean, mm. usually, I mean, you're obviously a very young, handsome man. Yeah, a young, uh, young but, 28, uh, 28, 28, 28, 28 29, something like that. Yeah. But uh, some people at this point in their life, you know, they've had a hugely successful corporate career. They have some money set aside. Usually they, they put on like lime green pants with little Right. fishes on it and go right. play golf down in Florida right. and live live the good life. I happen to know for a fact right. that just this past year you were in Cambodia. Yes. Yep. You were in Bangladesh. Yep. Yep. These aren't exactly yep. resort destinations and 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 also your care. I mean, this is this is heart, obviously heart-wrenching for the whole community, but you've been involved in ministering to uh, families that were affected by Sandy Hook and the shooting that took place there. Um this is some retirement you've carved out for yourself. Well, well I, what, what's your motivation? Well, first of all, I stink at golf, as you well know. That's, right? you know, you no. hit on something yeah, there, right, yeah. Right, it, no pun intended. No, no senior um, tour for, right, for right. you. So golf is not, not an option for me. <laughs> no, I, I, I just, um, I, I, first of all, it's what we're called to do. Uh, I don't think um, God is ever through using us. Um, and and I, I also am convinced um, as, as I know Mark, you know, as we've had the opportunity to, to get to know each other, um, that he will always use an experience from earlier in our life for later in life. And that no, no hurt ever goes um, without um, some form of use later on in life. Hmm. And no, no storm that we've gone through will never um, uh, be pointless. Uh, and we always have an opportunity um, that, that God will use that in some way later in life. And so, uh, you know, uh, given some of the, the joys as well as the storms that Karen and I have been through in our life, uh, it, it's kind of set the stage for now um, how he's using us. Plus, I don't think any of us like to sit around and sit on our hands. I mean, that's not what we were created to do. Hmm. Um, well, so. well, even tonight, before you came here, there's a ministry at Walnut Hill called Celebrate Recovery. Right. And if you're not familiar with Walnut Hill Community Church, I mean, I'm a little biased because I, I attend there, but it is a profound church. It's in, it's in Bethel. It's on uh, Walnut Hill Road, right behind the big Y. They have five services over the weekend, 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. And, and it is just an absolute emergency room for the soul. Yeah. Uh, people come with hurts and pains. Um, Issues that they're carrying with them, uh, addictions, broken families, wayward children, uh, vocational, money problems, things like that. And, and we, our doors are just wide open and we say, come, because we really feel like in a relationship with Christ, there are some answers to some of these questions. Answers to issues that, that you're facing that you might not otherwise realize what you're going through. But as John says... God is there with you. He doesn't yeah. say he protects you from the storm. He'll walk with you through the storm. Right. And no matter what it is, you think like, oh, geez, you know, I'm not going to a church. I got this going, that going. I've been divorced. I've had issues. I've had alcoholism, stuff like that. We, 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 that's what we, we major in. Uh, so if you have a chance, come to Walnut Hill. It's, it's, it's a profound place to come, and don't think you got to get cleaned up to come because guys like John Dissinger show up there. And, and, and that's right. Take, <laughs> that's right. Okay, uh, Mark, so, so what, what has your, and I know that, I think I know a little bit about, your father originally started this ministry. That's true. And you weren't necessarily going to go in this direction. You That's know, true, as, yeah. as gratifying as, as, it, as it is on an existential level, what did you go through that you got to the point where you said, you know what, this is where I need to be, this is what I need to do? Yeah, um, you know, uh, make the long story short, you know, I, I born in Bangladesh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, then um, after my high school, I came to U.S., you know, uh, in Texas, I went to school there, I graduate, you know, um, uh, and then I study, you know, business, uh, very good business. When um, uh, that I felt in my heart that uh, God is calling me for mission, you know, but uh, it was a big struggle because, you know, I had a very good life, you know, in yeah. the U.S., you know, sure. young life, have, you know, a good business. Um, in 1995, uh, when uh, I really felt that, um, you know, in my heart that God is saying that, uh, Mark, I give you this opportunity to come to a country 
the best country in the world, the best education, you have a good life. But uh, I want you to share my love, uh, lo uh, my uh, love uh, and the blessings I give you, the blessings share with your people. So, um, you know, end of 1995, when I decide that I'm going back to Bangladesh and, you know, uh, share the blessings God gave me all these years, share with them, you know, and that's, you know, basically more, it, it was an easy decision. It was a very hard decision. I sold my business. I went back to Bangladesh and got involved with CSS Christian Service Society. Now, Bangladesh, as I mentioned before, it's a beautiful country and mm -hmm. the people have hearts of gold, extremely hardworking, yeah, industrious, but it is in a, a rather impoverished country. And so to leave Dallas, Texas, is there, they, we're, we're in Texas, right, right. and go back to Bangladesh, there, there aren't a lot of McDonald's drive throughs <laughs> or, or you know, go to the Big Gulp and get a 7-Eleven and that kind of thing. So, so that took some soul searching yeah. to do. Yeah. Um, People are interested. Okay, there's there's this concept. And by the way, also, for those that are hearing this live, tomorrow night at Walnut Hill Church right. is going to be a uh, program on human trafficking. That's right. 7 o'clock? Uh, 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. Mm -hmm. uh, the doors mm -hmm. open at 6.30. Okay. Um, so you're welcome to come and uh, have some light finger food and kind of get settled. But the program does start. The evening starts at 7 o'clock. It starts with a panel discussion. We'll have a panel discussion. Uh, with uh, 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 folks from around the world, uh, as well as right, you know, right here in in Connecticut on mm -hmm. the whole area of human trafficking. Yeah, and what, what we were exposed to in Bangladesh yeah. were these were these large brothels, right? Yeah. where the women, many of them from very poor rural settings are in one way or another essentially sold into prostitution. That's great, I yes. mean, it's under the guise of, well, we're going to front you this money, and then they're middlemen that make some of the money, and mm -hmm. then they end up there, and, and the madam of the house essentially says, okay, you know, you owe us $200. You're going to start working this off, but we're going to give you room and board or whatever, and the, the debt never gets paid off. It's right. just modern-day slavery, essentially. Um, how do you minister in that setting? What What... What is your program? Um, we especially, you know, these uh, brothels, as you see, you know, uh, that is a mess. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. they have a very poor, poor, li you know, life they maintain there. So, you know, we, uh, f yeah, we help them physically. They need medicine, you know. We have a clinic there. Mm -hmm. So uh, we help them through that clinic. And also for the you know ladies, they would, you know they have kids. We have uh, orphan, you know, uh, we call home of blessings kind of orphanage where we bring yeah. the especially the girls because these young girls, you know, they are nine, ten, eleven years old when they get involved because they, all their life they see how their mom, you know, what they're doing. So in eleven, twelve, they get involved or the pimps, they take them to that, you know, force them to that uh, business. So we have a, you know, home, orphanage, you know, for these kids where they come, they get education, and, you know, they get, you know, uh, we take care of them. So a different way, you know, is uh, mentally we help them. We have a uh, session, go through, you know, the ladies where not only physical help, but they need mental, you know, spiritual, mental help. Mm -hmm. So we help them, we help their kids also, uh, especially the girls, as I said. So we have different way we try to help them. Mm. I think one of the most, probably the most profound day, because John and I just pulled, we were, we were over visiting Mark this summer uh, in Bangladesh, and we did a program on this uh, a month or two ago with some of the footage that we took there. Right. But probably one of the most profound and poignant day was I think one of the last days where we went to one of these brothels and we met some of the prostitutes that Christian Service Society works with. And some of these pictures as we go, um, you, you'll see, this is one of the prostitutes with um, one, of her, uh, one of her children there. But we, we went to the, the brothel and the day before we had been to one of these home of blessings, which is right. essentially an orphanage, and it's essentially the, the children that are the byproduct of the sex trade and one of the children at that orphanage was a daughter of the prostitute that we saw the next day. 
It wasn't this prostitute, it was another one, but this is, this is one of the sex workers there. Just lovely, lovely young, young ladies, and there's just such a sense of, of innocence, and yet they find themselves in such a difficult situation. But this particular um, prostitute found out that we had gone to that orphanage the day before, and I happened to have pictures, a group picture, of the uh, orphan, orphans that were there, and we expanded it and expanded it and found her daughter. And I think that was the first time she had seen her daughter in quite some yeah, time. Yeah. And it was just so comprehensive to see the work of the Christian Service Society in Bangladesh ministering to these women and their children at their point of need and just to see how there's some redemption brought, brought into an otherwise very dark place. It was really incredible mm -hmm. to see. And on our, we'll have it up as a graphic, there's a website for the Christian Service Society. It, they have a lot more information and also how you can become involved and you can help um, uh, uh, become involved. There it is, uh, Christian Service Society, www.cssbd.org, org, not com. And um, go to the website. You'll, you'll want to become involved because the, the ministry they're doing is just profound. Um, as we can, can you just put it back on the? Uh, oh, sure. sorry about that. Oh, geez. Yeah. If you can put it back on the um, uh, the slideshow. Yep. And as some pictures come up, if you could, Mark, just tell us what we're looking at um, sure. as as far as that goes. But I'll I'll tell you, having been over there for the time I was there, it was just compelling to see. Um, those young girls in the various orphanages. Right. So as the slideshows come up, if you can just like lightning round here, just tell us what we're looking at and, and what the ministry is. Yeah, this is one of the brothel. The ladies, uh, they're getting some training. This is the health program. You see uh, the hospital. We have a hospital called Ivan Abdul Adud Memory Hospital. That this was is, one of the girls right there. That right, was the one that right, was the daughter. Exactly, yeah. That's our leadership training program. These are for the uh, uh, young Christian boys and girls, those who are poor, cannot afford to go to university college. Um, that's one of the city where we're working in Khulna. It's a south side of Bangladesh. Uh, this is one of the area that we are working with the people. This is uh, the ladies. You see, there's, uh, you can tell there are a lot of Muslim ladies. We help them with the uh, loan program. This is one of our home of blessing. These are Christian kids. This is also a loan program. We help uh, people with a small amount, help them, train them. Uh, this is our polytechnical, our technical schools. Uh, the girls from the, our technical schools, once they finish the high school, they go to the technical school. Uh, they get, um, that's also the same. Um, this is uh, one of our clinic uh, where the kids and moms, they get this is one of the clinic, uh, rural, we call rural health center. That's me and one of our uh, staff who work in CSS more than 30 years. That's hospital, uh, the person got you know free treatment, got um, operation. That's the hospital front of the hospital, even Abdul the Memory Hospital. Home of Blessings, the orphanage pictures. Uh, the kids are singing, you know, worship, they're worship, uh, worshiping, that's the, you know, you can tell, they're praying. That's their dining place. How many uh, children in that picture, in, uh, the, in, in that dining room? Uh, 800, 842. 800 uh, that's me in my office. <laughs> That's our microfinance, so our ladies get like $50, $100 uh, to start a business and we help them. Uh, we are crossing the river. Uh, that's the one of the lady, the brothel lady, uh, that we you know, talked with them. Uh, some of CSS staff. Yeah. I think we're back at the beginning. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's, that's about it. So you John, what, what, what were your impressions uh, uh, as you were over there? Well, I, I, what you said earlier, Marty, um, an incredibly beautiful country, mm -hmm. uh, just a really gentle um, and beautiful people. I think that was my, my um, impression throughout the week that we were there. Mm -hmm. um, there were two, I believe, two aid workers that mm -hmm. had lost their lives right before we went over. 
Uh, and so when, I, when, when we arrived, um, I had some trepidation and some, some concerns. Now, when you but, say two aid workers lost their lives, right, two they, Westerners. Two Westerners. Right. And uh, uh, were, needless to say, I've never. you're very Caucasian and you seem uh, larger than normal when you're in Bangladesh. Yes, yeah, and yeah. so two uh, Western aid workers had been gunned down by some sort of uh, terrorist group. It, right. It, it, right, right, right. There was trouble at foot. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, but, you know, as we went, as, as you know, we went through the week and Mark hosted us and we walked the streets and we went to these different um, uh, visits to, to uh, you know, the, the uh, Homes of Blessing and uh, the microfinance visit and even out to the brothel. Mm -hmm. um, the gentleness of the people, the welcomeness of the people, um, the, it was just really, that struck me. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, the poverty. Um, the, the deep poverty um, is, is so different. It's a different reality in Bangladesh than it is in Danbury or than it is in Ridgefield. Yeah. Right. Um, but the peace and the love, um, the, um, the eagerness, I think, for the word, too, mm. um, is very real. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and, and so it was, uh, it was and then, uh, again, what struck me was even just being there a week, knowing that I could go back and I will be treated um, in a warm, loving way by the staff, by Mark's staff, um, is, is something that is, uh, is just really, um, it, it's, it's always will stick in my mind. Yeah. Um, the I know hospitality I can, the was hospital, unbelievable. That was the word I was looking for. The yeah. hospitality was just wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if someone wants to help, well, a couple yeah. things. Come to Walnut Hill tomorrow night at 7 o'clock yeah, and learn more about please. human trafficking and what's happening. You think this is just in a third world country, but it's actually Not. here in Connecticut as well. So you'll get some pretty profound information. But how, if people want to help, uh, can they donate money? What, what can they do to, to help the Christian Service Society of Bangladesh? Yeah, thank you, Marty. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you. You know, I know some of you uh, pray for CSS. Uh, so thank you for your, you know, prayer. Especially, you know, uh, my first request that, you know, you answered your question, pray for us, you know. It's a tough place, but uh, we are showing, you know, Christ's love through our work, like I explained. And um, if somebody want to uh, help financially, the best and easy way, you know, you can communicate locally with uh, Walnut Hill Community Church, mm -hmm. because we are partnering for many years. They're helping us. They can guide you through. You know, it's very easy. Just you know, call them. Mm -hmm. You know, communicate, and they'll tell you there is different way you can help them. You know, you can give your time, you can give your money, and most uh, you know uh, our need that you can pray for us. So please pray for us. You know. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, it, it's so great. I mean, as you uh, look and we, you talk about your Christian commitment. And uh, it says in the Bible, they'll know you're Christians by your love. That's right. And uh, the love that, that this man right here and the Christian Service Society of Bangladesh is, is just spreading around that country is just absolutely profound. And uh, I've been blessed to know you. And I'm Thank happy you. to call you my friend. Thank Absolutely. You. Thank you, Marty. John, same thing. You, Appreciate you coming Thanks in very much. And uh, we will do this all again next week. So this I, is Settle the Black Hawk. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, oh, you, you have to just quickly as a, just say how happy you are the Blackhawks beat the Boston Bruins in the Stanley Cup. That was a, a while ago, but yes, I, I'm, I'm pleased as punch, Marty. John Dishinger, a lifelong Boston Bruin fan, has fulfilled a bet. More on that la next week, but the Blackhawks did win. We've won three in a row, and, uh, you know, Patrick Kane, he's something to see. So thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next week, and I have no idea who's going to be on the show, but it will be entertaining. Good night.